So thank you, welcome back um, for the last panel of, of our summer conference. Um, uh, we are talking about the uh, value of data and how to assess the value of data in B2B uh, data sharing. Um, unfortunately, these slides uh, did not come out uh, very well. In, in, in the original one, there should be some arrows connecting uh, these four, uh, let's say, players. Um, so what I wanted to do here is basically to do a sort of a recap of the different forms of data sharing, B2B data sharing that we have been discussing since yesterday. So we can have a situation where uh, uh, the data holder uh, shares uh, give access uh, um, to the non-personal data to a third party. We can have data portability, which was the subject of the previous panel, where uh, basically um, it's the data subject to ask the data controller to um, give access to the data to a third party. And then in between, we have intermediaries which perform different functions uh, and basically connect uh, different parties together. So what are the values, what are the factors that uh, could be taken in consideration to assess uh, a data set, the value of a data set? Uh, clearly the volume, uh, the novelty, the quality of the data, but also some industry specificities in relation to the potential commercial use of the shared data, and also how, uh, let's say, the sharing will take place. Uh, um, this also affects uh, the uh, assessing process. Clearly, um, the data evaluation is complex, uh, and this generates what I call the data sharing paradox, which is somehow what we have been discussing since yesterday. So we are collecting, uh, especially platforms, but not only a large amount of data, which is mostly sealed and not shared um, with other parties. Um, the Commission in its data strategy in 2020 has emphasized that uh, data sharing should be compensated. And uh, clearly, monetary compensation is one possibility, but there are other forms of compensation. So it can be an exchange of data between different parties via data pool, or um, uh, giving a service in exchange of some kind of data. But also one possibility, it's also, it is also common, especially for government to business uh, uh, data sharing to give free access to the data sets, especially for reuse of historical old data. Who defines, uh, let's say, the terms of the compensation? So clearly the general rule should be the contractual freedom of the party, but we see at the EU level an increasing regulation of uh, compensation. So we have basically um, three possibilities defined by EU regulation, and I will come to that later. One possibility to give free access, open access to the data sets. Second possibility is to give access uh, on a cost based, cost only covering the data sharing cost. And the last one is uh, to give access to the data sets on the basis of front terms. So in these slides, uh, I have uh, um, a recap all the EU provisions uh, that concern uh, data sharing and that they have an impact on uh, compensation in B2B data sharing. I will not go for all these provisions, which we have been discussing since yesterday, most of them. I will say that there are two broad categories. So on one hand, we have data portability, so the right of the data subject to ask uh, the data controller to transfer data uh, to a third party. Um, this is the case uh, we find it in Article 20 of the GDPR for personal data. But now with the data proposal, we have uh, a similar right uh, when it comes uh, to um, non-personal data generated by the product user. Um, and we also, we discussed it yesterday, uh, have a similar right in Article 6, Paragraph 9 of the DMA. And then we have uh, mandatory data sharing, where the data holder is basically forced, uh, mandated to share data with a competitor. What about compensation in all these provisions? So my point here is that uh, the rules at the EU level on compensation are a bit puzzling. So when it comes to data portability under uh, 
Article 20 of the GDPR is not specified if uh, uh, data portability should take place free of charge. But then if you read Article 12, paragraph uh, 5 of the GDPR, it mentioned that any actions taken under Article 15 to 22 of the GDPR, so including Article 20, should be provided free of charge. So generally, data portability Article 20 is considered as a right of the data subject that can exercise free of charge. But when it comes to the Data Act, there is a difference. So when um, data portability concerns a sharing of data with a third party, the general rule is front-based, but when the recipient is a small and medium-sized enterprise, it's cost-based. And finally, Article 6, Paragraph 9 refers to free uh, data sharing. So we can discuss whether these differences make sense. Of course, we have different uh, legal instruments, but on the other hand, uh, we have been discussing since yesterday that there is a very thin line between personal and personal data, and these legal instruments increasingly overlap. And then when it comes to mandated data sharing, also here, most of the, I would say, legal instruments refer to front, but they are not always consistent when it comes to the formula used to define front. So I would like to stop here, and I would like now to give the floor to um, our speakers. So we have, uh, um, to my far right, uh, Isabella de Michelis. She is a technology and privacy expert. She is a founder of uh, and CEO of Erni App. Um, it's, um, it's, she's also a board member of several standardization body, and she has a lot of expertise when it comes uh, uh, to B2B, but also C2B data sharing. Um, connecting with us uh, should be Cosimo Pacciani. Cosimo, are you connected? Can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Okay, super. Um, unfortunately, Cosimo could not travel to Florence, but will uh, connect via Zoom. He's head of uh, Post Italiane Group Research Hub, and he has extensive experience in the banking sector in England and uh, in Scotland before joining Post Italiane. He gives Clearly, he brings the perspective of a firm that has uh, huge data sets. So it's a sort of uh, uh, controlling a large amount of data as post Italian. Then on my right, we have Guillaume uh, Duquesne. I hope I pronounced correctly your name. He's a senior vice president at Compass Lexicon, based in Paris. He has extensive experience in the EU and French competition policy, especially in regulated sectors like energy to communication and financial services where clearly access to data is quite important. And then on my left, finally, last but not least, I would say Bruno Basalisco, director at Copenhagen Economics. He has extensive experience in advising clients on the interaction of competition and the regulation in specific industries such online platforms, postal and delivery, utilities and e-commerce. And again, he has a lot of experience when it comes to data access issue. So I would like to ask uh, our panelists a number of questions. So first of all, what is from your experience, uh, what are from your experience the key factors taken in consideration by a firm to estimate the value of its data sets? Secondly, the role of intermediaries, can they help in solving this data evaluation problem? Third, uh, how do we apply front? I mean, the sort of magical formula, let's say, but what does it mean front specifically in B2B data sharing? And last, um, what about the Data Act that was discussed yesterday um, by the presentation of Vera Pilar de Castillo? So, as I mentioned before, Data Act uh, refers to different rules on compensation depending on the category of data recipients. General rule is front and cost-based compensation when the recipient is an SME. Does it make sense to have different rules? Can this be effectively implemented once the Data Act is approved? And last, uh, I will also have two questions for uh, our audience uh, connected via Zoom. Uh, audience which was a bit uh, silent, I would say, during the last two days, so let's try to engage them. Um, so we can launch uh, these two po uh, poll questions. So the first one is, should compensation in data portability be regulated? So do we have a sort of uh, market failure that uh, justifies uh, the regulation? Um, yes or no? 
and secondly, um, if yes, if you agree that there is a market failure, if you agree that we need to have uh, regulation on compensation, then what should be the appropriate compensation regime? Could we have a single compensation regime that encompasses Article 20, GDPR, Data Act, and uh, Article 6, uh, 9 um, of the DMA? Um, Maybe you guys do some exercise and also vote. So. Yes, the, so we will proceed in the following way. Um, so the um, the people online will vote, and in the meantime, um, you can basically reply to the questions. And if you want, uh, you can also uh, give your personal view about the poll questions but we will get we will show the results uh, of the voting at the end of the first round of intervention so i will start with isabella what is your view about intermediaries first and also um, your experience how uh, what are the factors taken in consideration in the data evaluation poll by a firm let's say please you have the floor uh, hello to everyone can you hear me too far okay okay to talk about data value, we need to go back to a couple of things as the concept of sharing. The title of the conference is governance, but then we've pretty much focused on sharing. I think it's a little bit important to say that the whole internet world, since we've started using the internet, is about sharing. Companies have been sharing data from day one. It's about sharing internet. It's about computer systems. The what really happened when data protection regulation and GDPR entered into force is that that sharing was subject to limitations. This is where the B2B world started to suffer because what before was easy, because you didn't need to ask things, needed to be done differently. That's when the DMA started emerging as a needed regulation because there were monopolies that might not want to hand out data that were necessary for others, for third parties. So that sharing wasn't that fluid anymore because of an horizontal regulation with extraterritorial applicability. It's a pretty big thing for the rest of the world to see what that happened. Then we have a third development and it does impact the valuation of data. Localization of data because of FRAM 1 and FRAM 2. That has a direct implication in how the sharing will cost to the parties to the sharing. So we have two different equations to solve. How to make the data fluid, because there are new restrictions for personal data. And I can say very, very frankly that because of the vertical directive that are now applicable in health and mobility space, there are also a lot of GDPR components in the B2B sharing, for example, for vehicle data because Mercedes has announced it's going to be integrating chat GPT in their cars, but without the user consent, it cannot share the data with Microsoft. And guess what? The new guidelines from ANISA on how you anonymize data for health records suggest that you can't even do it if you can't get the consent of the user to do it. So we have these horizontal rules, protection, and then vertical, specific, and then DMA comes on top of it and says, Monsieur Breton loves saying, I'm going to have a wonderful industrial sharing environment for companies to collaborate, compete, unleash value, bring consumer welfare, get down the cost of everything. It's impossible. The world doesn't work that way. And I've already said that to Monsieur Breton, and he doesn't like when I say it, because I work for an SME. We are, I'm a very small company, I'm a micro company. I had a company of 15 people. I'm a member of an association which groups 75,000 small medium enterprises companies in Europe, which are all interested in data portability, data use, data sharing, data reshare, APIs, interoperability, and data portability. And just to connect the dots of how much I'm going to pay what data went from home, based on which type of regulation I'm going to be relying on, it's a chaos. It gives a lot of work to the lawyers, which is fine, and a lot for the, the consultants as well. But the message is clear. First, Europe needs at least five years of peace to understand how to connect the dots on data, value, data valuation based on all these different components of 
are the data in Europe or not? So one of the most and for most important cost element for a data valuation is where the data are, how often I can get them, which format I can get it from. Are these legitimate data or not? And for what usage I can use those data for? So it boils down pretty much to a catalog. Markets need a catalog. But now comes the most interesting part of the story. Data marketplaces exist already. There are several that are very known. Snowflake, Rate, Amazon Web Service, Google, Microsoft Azure. There are a lot of data marketplaces. There are no interoperability, interoperability issues with these marketplaces. If you are a small company and you want to tap into the catalog and you want to buy those data, there's a beautiful catalog. You can buy telecom data. And what do you buy when you buy telecom data? You buy data from communications of people. Of course, they don't give you the name of the person whose communication is. But this is data that are supplied by the same companies that today require the fair share policy to be adopted because networks cost and we need to balance the cost. So let's be very careful. Data marketplaces exist. Data sharing existed. Data valuation B2B already exists. What is missing is a peaceful relationship between the buyer and the seller. That's why front comes in, because if there is a litigation on the how much, then you need a front framework to solve it. But there is one problem. If the human to machine interaction is basically creating, inferring 85, 90% of the data in the world, then it means that the B2B transaction on that 85% of transacted data set and data points touches an individual. It means it boils back to what that C component, consumer component, has to say with that B2B transaction. Is it for a time that it considers appropriate? Like, can it be foreseen, for example, that on the price point that the two B2B agree to, whether with an intermediate help or without, it was a B2B relationship exists already, they are automated already, all the servers are connected already, they can import data and exchange data and share data and send data. Of course, there are a lot of formats, it's a little bit crazy because you need to have a little bit of harmonization in that space, but clearly that's going to come because the industry wants it. And there is already a big initiative that the big guys are talking about, that it's called the DTI, that it's trying to come up with something that it's potentially like a universal conversion protocol for data exchange. I think it would be good if there is more than one, but I think it's good that there is industry showing that is needed because that will also infer in the price point the how many parties can rely on that to reduce the cost of the data sharing. So with a catalog, and data spaces is another way of creating catalogs. I'm a member of GAIA-X, so I can speak for the effort the industry is putting in creating these catalogs. But I can also tell you that even GAIA-X is pretty much in trouble with how to combine the legal notion of data user and data holder with data subject. Because these three things, they are linked, they are interlinked. If you're driving a car and that car is connected to the internet because it has a Wi-Fi or a cell connection modem, or much more, 267 sensors that Tesla load on the Tesla cars going around and which measures temperature, pollution, state of the infrastructure, um, state of the buildings around, and the car does it independently from the person who's driving it. Are these data IoT data or are these data back to the user who's driving the car, back to the user who's spying? buying the car, who's maintaining the car, who's recharging the car. At the moment, when the Tesla get charged, the data get downloaded because there is a B2B agreement between the utility company providing the electricity to recharge the car and the, and the car maker. But with the new regulation of the European Commission saying that the vertical regulation for the vehicle on board generation car, you need to have the consent of the user. Like for example, in the Data Act, there is a specific provision that says if 2B2B wants to make a deal, you can't forget from the getting permission from the user. And Mercedes made an announcement yesterday morning saying, I'm conditioned for the user to obtain. So I like Kristen's question about what's the effect on large language model training and the data collection and the data valuation and the interplay between privacy and data sharing. 
To train an LLM, you need a lot of data. And today, Microsoft made a big jump because it didn't want to pay those data. And I have to say, I have to praise the Italian Garante for what it did. And it said, these are personal data. You can't just free write on them. It's not just a copyright issue. It's a data, also personal issue. So you have in the, and then I'll, I'll boil down to the, my points, the final points as to what really, really makes the data valuable is the time interval at, by which a company can get it. Is it just once or always? It is the format. It is a reusable format, or do I need to do something else to use it? It is geography. Can I just use it in a certain jurisdiction or beyond that? And I really, really liked what the Goyan said about, are we really talking about internal market or we're talking beyond? We're talking beyond. The digital market is far beyond the internal market. It is the, so the legitimacy, legitimacy. Um, I'll, I'll finish here, but there are rumors in the market that says that the target, a targetable user in the advertisement industry in Europe is worth between $250 and $300 a month. A non-targetable user is worth two and a half. So you see what's the difference between two and a half and 300 and what the legitimacy of targeting gives to the person who purchases that profile or profile that user. So, and I'll give you just an example because it will help the questions later on. Um, have you heard about the Facebook pixel? I think you do. This is a typical sharing of B2B. Pixel goes on websites. Websites agrees to share data back to Facebook. Facebook processes it across all their applications and then can retarget on their own domains or on third party domains. This is a sharing. You don't need DMA to do this. Unfortunately, because of GDPR, Pixel will die. So then the publishers need another way to get the data that they got before through the Pixel. So it's a dispute problem. It's not a data sharing problem. Another example, the um, uh, WhatsApp. Everybody think about data portability in GDPR and data portability in um, DMA being Telegram users would want to start a Telegram, Telegram account and they've got all their contact list in WhatsApp and they should be able to port their contact list into Telegram. That's portability. It's a little bit like when you wanted to move from Gmail to Hotmail. It exists already since years, you can do it. You export all your emails onto the other email client and it's gonna work like a breeze. That's portability for a consumer protection thing. But the consumer might be much more interested and that would have an unfair effect in the price of the data to import in Telegram, it's chats because it's the chats that are profiled, not the numbers. So the number for WhatsApp, it's an identifier, but it's the way the user is identified. But the what really serves Facebook is to get the what the user says. So why the user would want to be doing that, except if he's looped in in the revenue sharing model. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Isabella. I would now like to uh, maybe stop sharing and I see Cosimo connected. Cosimo, you now have the floor, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, the answer to the, first of all, I would like to, I would like to thank you for having me even if I, I'm on a remote. Can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. You can see, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, you can start. Okay, okay, see you where. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to start from what Isabella said that at the end, because I think for me, it's very interesting because obviously in my previous jobs and also here in Boston, we have to manage substantial, or we have a substantial amount of data information coming from all the different businesses and areas where Poste operates. In my previous jobs, always I had a similar experiences to work with companies with largest weights of uh, customers and uh, also B2B relationships and also the capacity to have access to substantial amount of data. I, th I think the issue, if you look from after the first question in terms of the, what are the key factors that, uh, for example, in my job here at the research center are relevant for us, is precisely I think the last point Isabel uh, discussed. You know, I think where maybe 
looking at where the, all the regulation is pointing at and trying to achieve maybe still a kind of a missing point. And I, I will refer like uh, informal and formal data or informal, formal information that we have access when we talk about uh, what we have. So pretty much as she was mentioning the example of the WhatsApp, it's not really the personal data, but is the chat, is the interaction with uh, either the technology or with the territory, because Post Italian, interesting enough, uh, has, uh, is a company with a big number of branches on a territory where also potentially you can have access to a mix of formal data. So how people have access to the offices, how they, uh, what kind of services they, they use, uh, and we all link to the information. But there's also quite a lot on uh, informal part of information that uh, I think uh, is also relevant uh, in, in terms of understanding how you can uh, generate data from the correlation from from the relationships that happen using uh, either services or products or even pretty much uh, having businesses uh, dealing with each other. So when we look at, at the information in relationship in relation to the data. What is uh, what are the key factors that we look at? Uh, I think for us, uh, yes, I think it's relevant to look uh, about how the data is uh, going to be used. It's going to be an internal or uh, external reach of the information of the data we have. Uh, anyway, as we have quite a lot ongoing in in terms of being sure that we adhere to all the regulation in terms of. Uh, uh, privacy and confidentiality data, because obviously this is where you build the trust with your customers. Um, how much you want to segment the data, what is the kind of detail, and then how I think you're building the relationships between the data or the information you have. Before I will speak about informal and formal data, I think uh, it also is available before she mentioned what kind of data you want to have in terms of time, you want to have a real time information, and uh, post, for example, we operate uh, in a series of businesses where, for example, there's a big difference between uh, the data on postal services and uh, when you operate on financial markets, because uh, I don't want to make a joke, but I think postal services data, they travel with the postal vans, this kind of speed, <laughs> where financial markets, they pretty much, uh, there is a different kind of uh, time impression because markets nowadays, uh, the volatility is a squeezing time in one instant. So I think it's also fascinating for us here, for me at least, uh, uh, to look on also how, what kind of terms of frequency in terms of a uh, requirement you have in terms of lag time between uh, the moment where the data is uh, kind of originated somehow and when this can be formatted and used and uh, validated. And we say something about data validation after then I think it's even more relevant than data valuation because at the end, uh, the same concept of uh, value of an object or an asset also comes from the fact, especially nowadays, uh, uh, how much uh, is being this data validated uh, and checked and confirmed. So it's another important aspect for me. Uh, on the financial markets, I think nowadays uh, we have uh, a lot of tools through which we can validate the information in other sectors, I think maybe, and I think the focus of the regulators could also be on uh, not only on the access to information and data, but also to support the validation. Because you know, I don't want to go into the fake news or uh, territory, but there is quite a lot of capacity, I think, also to uh, to see what kind of data is really validated and usable and confirmed as uh, providing some added value information versus, uh, as you said before, I think you mark uh, numbers. Uh, this kind of the only aspect of the, um, I think there's an you know, element uh, of uh, data, I think for us, at least for me, but when we look at the, uh, the data, data valuation of the aspect is also how much the, that information is, uh, you know, it's a usual discussion seen from the noise, how much is used, used and usable to support not only us, but also our customer to reduce their own risks, improve efficiency, et cetera. And, so, and this is where I think, again, a different data set, different information that can, I think they could have a different, uh, let's say, value 
or relevance. I'll just give you a very stupid example. I think, well, as I say to Marco, I, I could not come for uh, not, not big, but some, some medical reasons to, 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 uh, to Fiesole. And uh, even because two days ago, I had to come to Florence for something else. Uh, but because of the, you say, for the stress, the heat, the invasion of tourism in Florence, et cetera, I decided it was for me better to take a bit of rest. I was imagining if somebody could have gave me all the information before uh, we were taken on the decision. I think this is where, again, uh, is how much you're able as a company, as an enterprise or corporate, because I'm thinking about, you know, today we are always connected. How much I'm able to code the user's information to show that what I provide is an added value to the customer. And so I go into the point that, uh, again, that uh, when we look at uh, what are the key factors, I think more and more, we are trying to see what are the information relevant and what are not. I think Isabel, she says something on the same, uh, on the same spirit, if I'm not getting it wrong, about, about how much, what, what is relevant. Is relevant the data per se, the personal data, the business information, the, the usage of some services, uh, et cetera, or is the, the correlation between the inference set of data, this is where the value happens. Because if I could put together the information in my little stupid example before on uh, train delays, uh, absence of taxes on Florence, uh, average temperature of the center of Florence during the summer, all put together to give it to me an indication that it was the case or not to travel uh, on that day, et cetera, I could have uh, an added value not coming from the single data. And maybe also adding, just an exaggerating example, my own personal health information. So I could have information could help me to take a better decision about my personal life uh, rather than, uh, and this is where I think the regulation I think uh, should focus uh, a bit more. In a recent forum, I said, I think the problem is, I think we're focusing a lot of uh, data privacy, et cetera, where there's much, not much done on uh, how the data is used and algorithms are built, et cetera, and how the data are validated for usage. So um, I, I think, so when we look again, going back to the quest, I think in terms of the key factors, I think uh, for us is really going back to the beginning is about the, you know, the kind of user I'm going to have the data, the kind of precautions I need to have in order to protect the customer, integrity, but also to continue to promote the idea that user this information, I can provide another service. And I think the timing issue, I think the value is also given depending on different businesses, what is the time lag between when the data is originated and when it can be used or fragmented or recomposed for any user can have of that. Super, thanks a lot, uh, Cosimo, for your, um, let's say, insight uh, uh, expertise that you could share with us. Before I give the floor to Guillaume, um, I would like to remind uh, the audience connected to via Zoom uh, that they can type their questions on the chat. We will uh, reply to them after the first round of intervention and they can also uh, vote so they can uh, basically express their opinion about the two uh, poll questions. Guillaume, uh, what is your view about the FRAND formula, about this magical formula? How would you interpret it in the context of B2B data sharing? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for the invitation today. Um, in the end, I mean, we, we have been discussing, I mean, the, the, the value of data um, in itself, eventually also, I mean, whether we need to share, how we need to share, but then as soon as basically we decide that we need to share data, there is a question as to how we price those, uh, those data to some extent. And indeed, in this respect, basically the Data Act, I mean, provides some guidance. So basically, when it comes to sharing between, I mean, the data holder and the users, and this is free of charge, so we know what is the price, this is zero. When it comes to, I mean, sharing data between, I mean, the data holder and third parties, and we have two situations. If this is SMEs, then basically the data act is precise that it should be kind of, you should charge some form of marginal cost of sharing the data. So this is also quite clear. And then there is a third category, which is all, I would say, all the rest. This is, okay, when you are not an SME, you are not a, 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 a user, then the question is, um, okay, what is the price, I mean, uh, you should set for the access of data, and, and here the data acts, uh, it should be friend, okay? So then the question is, okay, what friend means in, in the context of, of, 
of data of data sharing. Um, and in this respect, um, I mean, from very high level perspective, I would say when we think about I mean access price, I mean for me it has kind of two components. I would say the first one would be kind of the cost of sharing the data. So this is really what does it cost me to share the data, and then there is plus something a markup that eventually I mean reward the data holder for I mean collecting and then sharing the data to, to, to some extent. So basically, there are those two components. The first one is pretty clear and, and we can discuss. And then there is this kind of markup component uh, that we need to try to assess. And, and this is kind of my perspective. This is kind of the difficult part. Uh, but we, we, we do have kind of uh, a lot of insight. I mean, I, at least we can draw insight from uh, what have happened in other, I would say, regulated industry where basically we needed to, to set, uh, um, I mean, price for access to, I mean, certain infrastructure, for example. And here, what we draw, or what I draw from 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 this, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, from experience, is really that the methodology we, you will use in order to to set the, the access price really depend on what is kind of the underlying uh, policy objective, because the, this is really what is going to drive, I mean, how you will set the, the the access price. And broadly speaking, there are kind of two, I would say, yeah, two main objectives that may to some extent conflict with each other. The first one is kind of uh, allocation efficiency, if I can say so. So this is just to say the data is there and I want to maximize the use of data. And in this respect, basically what you would want to do eventually is to set uh, an access price that is very low so that uh, as soon as someone can use the data in order to create value, then basically he can do it. So it would advocate for a very low access price and basically you will go for a price that is cost reflective to some extent and we can discuss what cost mean. Then there is kind of a I would say a second objective you may have is to make sure that you maintain incentive for the data holder to continue collect, create, I mean, the, the data sets that can then be used eventually by, by others. And this is what I would refer like dynamic efficiency. This is not just looking at the users, but to make sure that we have the right investment. And in this case, basically, I mean, just having a, an access price that reflect, I mean, kind of marginal cost of sharing is not enough. You need to have a markup, a markup that is not zero, that may be sizable. And the question is, okay, what would be the level of this, uh, of this market? And in this case, basically, you can wonder, indeed, uh, to which extent this market needs to reflect the value of the data for uh, the data uh, recipient. So we have this trade-off, and actually this trade-off is very well, to some extent, reflect in the Data Act, in the sense that basically the Data Act may make it clear that on one hand, basically we want to foster, I mean, the sharing of data, so, so as to make sure that we foster innovation, in particular in aftermarkets, and we need to make sure that basically there are kind of innovative solutions that, uh, that are developed in those markets, etc. But at the same time, we have this kind of uh, safeguard or, 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 or this point that basically we need to, be, to make sure that we preserve incentive of data holder to, to, to I mean, generate, collect those data. So, I mean, these trade-offs that we have kind of, we have had in other sectors, we have exactly the same one. I mean, at least it is reflected in the data act. With one addition, which is the data act is also mentioning, I mean, this point about, uh, um, I would say, uh, asymmetry of bargaining power between, I mean, the data holder and the data recipient, as, as we were mentioning before. So this is not, I mean, a question of sharing data. This is also how we split the value. Okay. So having said that, uh, then the question is, okay, we have also subjective and what do we do in practice? So if basically we want to actually, I mean, put much, I would say on the, on the short term efficiency, the locative efficiency, it would advocate, as I was mentioning, for a cost based approach. And in this case, basically, the question we should ask ourselves is, okay, should the data holder be uh, remunerated, I mean, or, uh, for, or the price access uh, should be set such that uh, the data holder cover it some form of marginal cost of sharing the data? I think that the data act is quite clear in this respect that basically it should be the case. So the price, uh, the access price should at least cover the marginal cost of sharing the data. And as has been said, basically, when we say marginal cost of sharing the data, it is not just sharing the data. I mean, as we know, there, there is a lot of kind of cost involved in terms of making sure that the data are uh, uh, reliable, that basically there are all the I mean, security city in place so that basically you can really transfer the data in a, in a secure environment, etc. So when I say cost of sharing data, it covers kind of a lot of stuff. But then you can say, yeah, maybe we can allow a bit more still with the cost 
based approach, we could say, in addition to covering the marginal cost of sharing the data, then I want also co to cover some form of investment in collecting the data, et cetera. So basically, we, we switch from kind of a really marginal cost approach to something that is uh, more what you would see, for example, in regulated industries like electricity sector, et cetera, where you cover, I mean, marginal cost, but you also also to, to cover kind of reasonable return on investment. And then there is a question as to what we mean in terms of investment from the data holder. Is it just, I mean, the investment you make in order to collect the data, or this is more than that? And just to provide very, I mean, simple example, if you think about smart car, what you can say is that, okay, we have had car for many years now, and now we have smart car, so we add a, an additional device in the car, and then this device will be kind of a sensor, for example, that will be collecting data. And you could say the investment, the incremental investment, is just this specific device. But the truth is that one could argue that this is not only the only thing that really matters in terms of data-specific investment, because the fact that you are able to generate and collect, I mean, high-quality data may also be due to the fact that you are investing in the quality of your product that then allow to have really kind of valuable quality data. And in this case, it means that basically the price of access should not just cover, I mean, the increment co uh, uh, incremental cost of the small device you put, but actually it should also cover part of the cost of, uh, I mean, the investment you are making in the, in the car. So this is really having the cost framework in, in, in mind. And what we see is that even with the cost framework, uh, this is not that easy to see what, uh, what, uh, what would be relevant. Then maybe going on the other side. So cost, and if we say, okay, let's depart from cost, and let's say that the data holder is allowed to some extent to make, I mean, some money on the data he's collecting. So basically we say the pri access price should not, uh, should, should, should not just compensate for, for for the cost of producing the, or collecting, transferring the data. Then I would distinguish two very different scenarios. I, at least I think that this dichotomy is important and has been already mentioned this morning. This is when you are sharing data with someone that is competing with you in the aftermarket and when you are comp uh, sharing data with someone that is not competing with you. Because I think that the, the rationale and, and the way you would set price should be very different. So when you are competing, so basically it means that in this case, why are you sharing data? Why the data act is asking you to share data? This is because you want to foster competition in the, in the, in the down, uh, I mean, in the, in the after market or in the downstream market. And in this case, basically the access price should be set in a way that it low competition. So basically we are back to some of the discussions that have been, I mean, uh, uh, in the, in the telecom industry, for example, whereby the price you set for the access price should make sure that an as efficient competitor or sometimes a slightly less efficient competitor can compete in the aftermarket. And it means that basically you need to have some, in order to set the price for the data, you need to have in mind some form of margin squeeze framework or as efficient competitor framework. So as to make sure that basically the price of the data allow, I mean, competition, okay? And you can go as far as going for an efficient component, uh, component pricing rules, whereby, I mean, uh, you will get a bit more rent to, to the data holder, so preserving, I mean, the, the incentive, but then you can slightly deter also uh, competition in the aftermarket. So this is really in the case where the aim of sharing data is to foster competition. So you need to have an, an access price that allows that. And when I'm saying you should set the price as the access price so that it passes the kind of the as efficient competitor test, I should not truly say that. I should say that the, the cap, the maximum price you should be able to charge is the one that allow entry, okay? But it means that if there is actually competition for the supplier of data, I mean, the, 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 the price of data may be much more lower. But we need to fix a cap just to make sure that we are kind of, we, we, we allow competition. Then maybe the, 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 the second, I mean, the second scenario I was referring to is that when you share data with someone with who you are not competing, then basically the question is very different because the access price and the right level of the access price is not really a matter of allowing competition. The, the, the price is there in order to make sure that you share the data and you allow someone in a complementor or eventually a, a completely, someone in a completely independent industry to actually use those data in order to produce innovations that can benefit for everyone. And in this case, I have the feeling, but maybe I'm mistaken, that we, are, we get closer to, I mean, the essential pattern kind of type of framework where the question is really, there are some values that is created in the market. And the question is how you split this value between the various contributors. 
And this, it echo back to the point that uh, Isabella was mentioning is there is a point about, I mean, bargaining power. This is not just a matter, uh, this is not an issue of sharing data. This is a matter of making sure that basically we have shared split of the value. And in this case, basically what we know uh, is that, I mean, from experience, for example, in the patent industry, I mean, there are a number of techniques that have been already developed that allow to get a sense as to what should be a reasonable, uh, I would say, access price. Uh, obviously, when there is a market for data, so marketplace for data, then basically, I mean, we have a market price, so this is kind of easy. Uh, but, but when we do not have, uh, I would say, market price, then basically there are two main, I would say, ways uh, that have been explored in the past in order to, 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 uh, to put a price for the access to, I mean, to facility, but in this case, uh, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be data. One is, I would say, benchmarking. So basically to look at, I mean, the type of arrangements that have been taking place, I mean, in more or less similar circumstances and to look at the price that have been agreed. And we say this price has been agreed. And if it has been challenged in court and have been kind of validated by court, then basically this is good, good benchmark to use. Uh, but, but I think that in this case, there are two issues. The first one is we are just at the beginning. So basically, I'm not sure whether we have a lot of very, I mean, powerful and uh, insightful benchmark, but for, for market data. And the second point is uh, what may be very difficult is to say, okay, this contract is kind of comparable. So what, what do we mean by benchmark? What we do, we do we mean by, I mean, contracts that would be kind of comparable? And then again, we have techniques, I mean, in order to try to make those contracts comparable to, to really infer the, the, the value of, of the asset that is, uh, that is exchange. But again, I mean, this is not completely trivial. And maybe the last uh, technique that has been kind of developed recently also, uh, especially in the patent industry, is those, uh, I would say, net present value analysis. So the idea is quite simple. I mean, simple in principle, and when you try to apply it, this is extremely difficult. Uh, this is really to say, I'm sharing data. It allows to create kind of product. There is a value that is created. And then basically the question is, what is the amount of the value that is created and how it's, it's pre, I mean, it is split between the various, uh, uh, various, uh, um, I mean, group. Uh, so both, I mean, the, the data holder, the, um, uh, the data recipients that develop the product and then, uh, basically the, uh, the, the customer. And then there are all those questions that have been already mentioned as to who is contributing and whether this is the data, is it really, I mean, the core input or whether this is the way, I mean, the data recipient will use the data and all the inside. Basically, there is a difference between having a broad data set with numbers and then having a data set that actually is useful in order to produce innovation. So this is the way you looked at the data set and the, and, and the, the, the IP you put into, I mean, how do I interpret the data set and how I can use it to develop. So, so there is a question as to the, the, the split of, uh, of value. So maybe just to conclude, uh, and just probably to, to revert back to the question about how we, uh, we apply friend in the context of the data, data act. I think that number one, this is not completely clear to me. Uh, in the sense that, uh, yeah, I mean, basically I do see many situations where you may want to do uh, many different stuff. I think that there are a lot of met uh, methodology or approach that, uh, that, uh, that we have uh, as tool in order to infer uh, the, the, I mean, what should be the, the access price. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that there is a one fit all approach. And uh, if I, I want to be a bit uh, cynical, uh, I would say that uh, basically, um, I think that there is a lot of uncertainty, but basically after years of litigation, I think that we will get a sense as to what uh, friend mean in the, in the data act. Thanks a lot, Guillaume. Uh, so, uh, Bruno, do you agree with him? What, what's your view? Thank you, Marco. Thank you all. It's, uh, of course, a daunting challenge to uh, be at the end of a very smart and uh, uh, proficient uh, set of speakers and indeed at the end of the, of the conference. Um, I'll be sharing a few thoughts. Part of this maybe we'll try and join the dot and uh, recap. And I'm, of course, very grateful to many um, clever colleagues, in particular, uh, Paolo Becassis, Neil Gallagher, who've led uh, a discussion paper we've uh, recently put out on the, uh, on the um, access to digital assets. We have lots of important questions here, conceptual and uh, applied, that will define whether the uh, regulations we've been discussing today, in particular the DMA and Data Act, will be a success or whether it will be a quagmire for firms and ultimately policymakers themselves to resolve. Um, there are lots of you know, high hopes and expectations, but uh, all the hard work is yet to come. And maybe there are also some 
there was a good point about what is the policy aim of some measures and maybe there are some good old-fashioned fudges that happen at the end of negotiations and which ultimately leave us and leave industry without the clarity 100 percent clarity which of course is an ideal and and and, and creates a, still a gray area um, previously on B2B data sharing, uh, we have been discussed uh, and I think has been introduced also in the previous um, conversations. One of the closest uh, pieces of legislation, I think uh, Marco, you've shown many others, is the database directive. Um, not, not an earth shattering piece of legislation uh, with the evaluation study for DigiConnect as part of the Data Act initiative. The database directive contained a sui generis right, Article 7 which at best tries to solve the question of whether to force access, not really the terms and price, but even that, this relatively minor piece of legislation, as usual, led to several years of Court of Justice of the European Union uh, cases, including a relatively recent one uh, on, on online CVs. And uh, the conclusion, the best that the court, the, the, sorry, that the Court of Justice of the European Union could do under this very narrow specified provision on databases was, well, tell the national court to evaluate whether there is a risk to the possibility of redeeming the investment by the uh, data uh, owner, database uh, owner, through the normal operation of the database in question. So whether if you give access, you are undermining the ability to recoup the investment. So that's kind of a difficult question to let the national court operate. So it kind of suggests why there was a policy aimed to cut the Gordian knot and put some clearer case for opening up the B2B um, data sharing. Um, so now we have friend enshrined in DMA, uh, search engine, um, application stores, uh, um, social networking. And we have in Data Act all over the economy, a, a, a flood of, of um, access regulation where data can be requested by users or by third parties. And indeed, if the latter um, friend applies. Several commentators have flagged um, this cannot be the same path when we applied FRAND, when we will apply FRAND in, in this digital asset space as has been uh, applied in uh, SCPs due to much different circumstances. I think we've heard it in the European Commission uh, um, DMA implementation workshops and in others. So, okay, but then so what? Uh, already it's difficult to apply FRAND in SCPs. Now we need a new path. Mm, so I think my, my two main points from today are some further guidance will be needed and um, my uh, professional services uh, campaign statement, if I was a politician, I would say make regulation boring again. I think we have all this excitement, all these open spaces here, but it's going to be a, a nightmare and a problem going also my, against my own commercial interests as someone who wants to continue a career in providing advice. But if um, there is not more guidance, uh, I think there is a, there is a, it's not workable for, for, for industry and ultimately for policymakers. So how do we make regulation boring again? Well, let's take it uh, step by step. Um, the key question, and I think we've touched upon this also earlier on, is between cost-based versus value-based approaches. The key trade-off remains between allocative and dynamic efficiencies. And yes, we've heard that the poly, one of the main policy aims is opening up, letting the data be used, thinking about aftermarkets in the Data Act, but uh, there is still the, uh, the, the question about you know, incentives to invest. Um, the key disconnect is, is there a situation with these digital assets? Digital assets, of course, is a broad world where we have many business models in DMA and <laughs> whatever is that hardware manufactured product you know devices you know data produced all over the economy so but ultimately the disconnect between could the incremental cost of providing access be negligible compared to the overall value of the digital asset itself are we talking about two quite different uh, elements and uh, therefore whether and how to determine on the the value of a single asset specific to the access seekers business purpose. So how do we identify specific points? Um, there are some challenges when we're thinking about DMA implementation of FRAND. If the access price is set based on the gatekeeper's total revenue from the regulated digital asset, is it only access, access seekers with the similar scale to the gatekeeper able to profitably buy access? This is one of the trade-off. I think you, you mentioned this, Guillaume, thinking about the as efficient or reasonably efficient competitor. It's hard enough in a um, linear value chain industries such as uh, telecom and others where the vertical model has been applied. It's hard enough there, even more complex in uh, 
in, in the various business models that surround the DMA and the users of the DMA access, regulated access. Another tricky question, uh, which also we know uh, is complex due to other uh, regulated sectors, is can value-based pricing be reconciled with a non-discrimination obligation? This is a long-lasting question in any B2B services in regulated sectors, because in B2B there is normally scope for negotiation and different forms of uh, differentiated pricing for value-based pricing. Uh, see business connectivity services in telecoms, see bulk mail in postal, and other wholesale relationships. So how do we apply non-discrimination while still allowing commercial flexibility? Um, it's difficult to envisage, to answer your question, uh, it's difficult to envisage a sustainable, effective separation separation line between what access business, business terms are given to SMEs as opposed to other access seekers. Also, SMEs may be growing, may be purchased, there may be the different uh, ownership structure questions to be solved just to answer the question of what should be the price of, of data. So that's, 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 that's too tricky in, in, in my view. Uh, ultimately, how will regulators and courts step in to guide and direct the emergence of front prices for the digital assets in scope of the various regulations, I mean, DMA and Data Act, first of all? Will regulators and courts find a middle way between cost and value-based approaches? That's, that's, that's an open question. Uh, how do we make regulation boring again? Well, I, my call here is for further guidance uh, to uh, try and direct, direct the, the outcomes in a way that the current uh, legislation uh, does not. Let's look at some court cases that have been high profile. Not necessarily it's a one-to-one -one fit with the many different business models and regulations we have here, but take the US Apple versus Epic case. Sure, lots of headlines and media and press, but what did it boil down to? What did the different experts clash on in the end? key question was about the nature and scale of costs associated with the, you know, the, the, the business model, in that case, App Store. So, um, but how do, well, that's not I mean, the only element, of course. So what can guidance do to make life easier? At least for DMA, I'm not sure about Data Act. Data Act, I think we're all scratching our heads and we will do for a long time. Uh, provide guidance as to definition to an asset base. Now, we have in some of the more static and less competitive network industries, regulated sectors, the concept of regulatory asset base. It's a simplification device, but it helps uh, deliver uh, business certainty and uh, also that trade-off between allocative and dynamic efficiency in a quite static way. So, but even if you should not do a static regulatory asset base in these sectors, as if you were regulating water networks of airports, um, identifying the assets and understanding of asset-based components, it gives a helpful step to appraise costs. Now, of course, this is also quite sensitive because once you try and identify costs and you also have information on revenues pertaining, suddenly you can infer margins. And this is, of course, you're tempted to infer margins. That's, that's uh, also hot, uh, hot stuff. And it kind of uh, begs further question on, 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 uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the performance of the industry. So um, we have remaining policy questions about what, what policymakers are trying to achieve. The focus of aftermarkets clashes also with the role of vertical integration as a force for competitive progress and, and uh, innovative success and ultimately um, consumer value. The pricing of access to digital assets will affect the make versus buy decision. Now, we know from transaction cost economics, this is not the only factor, there are other factors, but as we heard in the first presentation of this panel, there are already many barriers and frictions. So if even the assessment of pricing on top of existing barriers and frictions adds to the transaction cost boundary barriers here, we are in a difficult um, situation. And in the data act, it's, it's very difficult, even evaluating whether and to what extent the access seeker will, is a competitor to the, the, the entity granting access. So that's a, that's, a, that's a kind of worms, even in more static, stable, vertical, one vertical sector, it's, it's, it's even harder in, in data act. So we will be scratching our heads for a while and guidance would be welcome to restrict the, the, um, the option space and, and, and clarify. So I think there's work to be done for policymakers. This conference takes pride in bringing messages that policymakers can then work on. That, that would be my suggestion. I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Bono. Uh, so we now have uh, one question from uh, the chat, from Antoine Don. Should the legal constraint that uh, 
make the value of the data itself and the process of data sharing more or less costly be taken into account for the evaluation of the data. I think it's uh, addressed to all of you, let's say, if you want to pick it up. And then from the audience in the room, um, okay, we can take these three questions, okay, please. So I would suggest we collect all the questions. We now also show the results uh, of the polls, okay. Do we have a market failure that justifies sex ante conversation? Okay. Yes. Okay, we should be uh, then. And the winner is? The winner is uh, Fran. Okay, even though we don't really know what does Fran means from, uh, <laughs> from the comments <laughs> so far. Okay, very good. Um, so please go ahead. Um, but maybe, maybe very briefly, if I may comment on, on, the, on the, the, the poll. Um, wouldn't you agree that, that open and free access is basically a, a special case of friend? So just to, 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 to throw that. But my question what actually was going to, to Isabella and Guillaume. Um, so first on, on Isabella, um, your very opening remark about um, basically reminding us that the internet was all about sharing and I fully agree. But then where I don't agree, if I may uh, say so, is on, on basically pointing to privacy and the privacy requirement as being the kind of the, the barrier to, to the sharing. And the reason why is because, yes, it's true that in the past, um, nobody actually really had to worry about privacy because we usually never really shared all our lives on the internet back then. But I would say more importantly is there was a time when basically big money came into into, into the internet ecosystem and where, for instance, um, creating user login was a sustainable business model in order to grow. So closeness is an important part for a lot of companies to, to grow and it remains an important strategy just to, to, to basically give a counter argument. But where I agree with you is that in terms of valuation, it is very important to take into account the data user, the data subject in particular, and the, the, the data holders. And that kind of triangle is a very complex situation. There I agree. Um, now to Guillaume, I very much like your, your reasoning and, and basically the theoretical um, argument behind, behind your, um, your thesis, so to speak, um, where I, th I see potentially a, a, an area um, where you may have not taken into account is the fact that for a lot of companies, um, the, a lot of companies are not aren't just creating and generating the data in order to sell it, in order to commercialize it. Very often there is actually already value generated um, based on the actual use that they're doing. So if I take the example that you gave about electric or um, um, vehicles, the, the device that is being put there is in order to generate some benefits uh, for the company itself. So when you calculate the, the, the basically the marginal or uh, the um, suitable price, you basically would also need to take that value into account, right? So this is basically my question. Okay, thank you. Then we have uh, Scott. Hi, uh, Scott Marcus. I'm on the scientific committee here, as everyone knows. So uh, thank you very much to everyone for a really great, great panel. Uh, I, was, I wanted to particularly give some reactions to Guillaume and Bruno for, I think, very insightful uh, comments about the, the pricing question. Uh, both of you touched very briefly on telecoms as a, as a case study, and I think it makes for an interesting case study. I, I had a, the, uh, the honor about a year ago uh, of writing the recommendations and findings of a study for the commission on how to promote very high capacity networks. And really kind of a conclusion there is that cost-based is not cost-based and fair and reasonable is not fair and reasonable. Um, effectively, if, if you look at the existing experience in telecoms, which is an area where the, the, the court cases have been around for a long time, this is a relatively mature area for, uh, for cost analysis and, and, and for, uh, for pricing controls. Um, and yet, uh, even within, uh, within cost base, you have uh, you know, huge debates about what actually should go into that assessment of cost. You have, other, you have specific cases where instead of a hard cost base analysis, rather it's economic replicability. There's at least one case where the regulated asset base, coming back to Bruno's point, comes into play. And then the question whether accumulated depreciation is relevant for that asset base. With fair and reasonable, 
there actually are multiple places in the European Electronic Communications Code where fair and reasonable pricing comes into play. But the experience, and this was a very strong message from the regulators in Barrick, is the question of what constitutes fair and reasonable is highly case specific and, 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 and fact specific. Um, and perhaps one interesting example that we have uh, is uh, the case of civil infrastructure where for incumbents, you would generally have a cost-based rule, whereas for other firms uh, and non-incumbent firms, you would uh, have a, a fair and reasonable standard through the so-called um, uh, BCRD regulation, uh, which is hardly ever used because it generates prices that don't make sense. So uh, again, just you know, for your reflection, uh, I, I think that you were very much on point to say it's a hard problem. And Bruno, I think, very much on point to say we have work to do and it would be nice if the regulation could become more boring over in, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any one last question? Um, yes, can you all hear me? Um, it's Katie O'Leary from the Data Protection Commission. Um, so you couldn't probably guess that I'm going to talk about privacy as Christian did. Um, so it's really really interesting discussion thank you to all the panelists and um, and it's interesting to hear about the the various costs of doing business and i know that the gdpr can be seen as a cost of doing business and as a regulator obviously we're fully aware of that and um, but just to also add to the discussion the broader aim of the gdpr is to protect a fundamental a right to data protection that needs to be protected in the online space um, and that that's, that right isn't something that was invented by the GDP or it has a long history and um, very similar obligations were set out in the previous directive 9546 which also created restrictions on sharing and required uh, principles to be complied with required lawful basis for processing one of the main differences is that there weren't that many or any sanctions for breaking the law so the GDPR definitely creates more incentives to comply um, and the GDPR does obviously envisage balancing against other interests and rights um, but I just wanted to add that to the, the discussion just to emphasize the, the broader aims of the GDPR and um, not to create is not purely to create a business cause or it's, the aim is not to create a business cost but um, to, to protect that fundamental right to data protection Thanks a lot. So I will now, since we are running out of time, ask all the speakers very quick intervention. Two minutes per person, let's say, following the, the if you want, you can, let's say, you, you pick up the question that you want to reply, and if you want, you can also comment the results of the, of the poll. So we start with Isabella, Cosimo, then Guillaume, and finally Bruno. Two minutes per person. Per person. Okay, let me, let me give you like a metaphor. You take a line, and you put on point A, the fully anonymized data that cannot be reconciled with anyone at any time ever. And on the right side, consent is legal basis as the extreme other side where you can create a digital right management system for consent management, which allocates value in the market because it can be used by the companies to essentially price data. I get a bulk set of data one day, with purpose scientific research, I'm going to pay less than if I'm buying continuous data, always on for the next three years because I'm a programmatic advertisement platform. Okay, so you have this line on the one side, you have rights defined, parameters technically implemented, engineered, passed through the system. Everyone knows what is transparently available to everyone. You get the price. On the other side, you have the non-personal, super privacy enhanced technology is implemented in platforms and systems, and you can somehow try to forget about the user, the user in the sense of the data subject, the end user. Here, you have a really B2B environment. You really need front here, because otherwise they're not gonna be settling down anything, and it's gonna be a price litigation. It's not gonna be a non-front compliant framework. It's gonna be, am I, price, am I paying the right price? Where the right price, is it for the transfer of the data, or it is for the semantic of the data? And the problem starts with the semantic, what data get transacted, not the how I get the data going from A to a third party. So FRAND is very appropriate for this environment on the left side of my metaphor, but it's 50% of the data in the market. You've got the 85% on the other side. So we need to be a lot more creative in how to get the price transparent out to make all the parties benefiting from this bigger portion of data which answers back also the question online as to 
We shouldn't be seeing this as legal constraints. This is about usage rights. We manage rights on everything. This is the way it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Cosimo, two minutes. Yeah, no, thank you very much again for the, for the debate, for, for the, the inputs. So, uh, I think, yes, going back to the, to the, to the concept of, uh, I think, uh, on, the, of a, on the compensation and how to approach uh, this issue, because obviously as a company we own and we hold a substantial amount of data, both, as I said before, the formal and informal information what I start to define uh, experience data, because I think the, the, the next step will be not only to define uh, uh, the, 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 say, the compensation in relation to the own, uh, or the, or the simple set of data, but also what kind of articulation and attached, uh, let's say, uh, say mm, attached uh, uh, complements or sets of information I have to that. I think maybe also echo what I was saying in terms of the of the of, of the experience of data. I, I think uh, first of all, I think there is an issue about. Uh, um, I think there's a, maybe to have a bit more focus on on the cost that data generation has also for the companies because uh, uh, I think that obviously is uh, is about uh, collecting, storing, using for formatting. Uh, and, uh, and uh, et cetera. Um, this is where maybe should we be more focused. Maybe I'll try to answer one of the questions on, uh, on, on, on what is the cost base that they will allow you to have this formation to keep it relevant and validated. Sorry if we go back to the data validation, but for me it's really, maybe coming from the financial markets perspective is really one of the issues because it, it, I think it's important. And then for owner, uh, Utilization or, or the or the work you want to do with, with the same data, and uh, and and I think also maybe there's quite a lot of focus on SMEs uh, where in reality I think we need to start to maybe put a bit more emphasis also on uh, also on large companies and large conglomerates that also have access or produce or, or distribute or generate a substantial amount of data, and this is where maybe. We, so with some potential, let's say, I, I think there is a paradox. So sorry, and then I will finish with pass to the other. I think, I think there is a paradox that somehow because uh, the fact in the future will be more and more, I think catalogs and capacity also for SMEs to have data and the big companies, they, they could be, maybe they still use their own information. There could be some effect or distortion also from that point of view. So I, I think for me, really, one of the focuses would be really at this, you know, how then the frank compensation is correlated and linked to the cost of data. Thank you, Cosimo. Guillaume. Um, <clears throat> I will try to comment on some of the question uh, being very brief. So I think the first question as to whether the value of the data and the cost of complying with regulatory framework, I mean, should be taken into account when pricing data. Um, I think that when it comes to cost, I would agree that it should be reflect. When it comes to value of data, I think that this is, I mean, what I was saying before, uh, which is, I mean, it really depends, uh, I mean, the objective and uh, as, I mean, has been said, I mean, wh what is uh, fair and reasonable will be case specific and will need more guidance to, to indeed know what is the share of the value of data that should, should, should be reflected in the access price. Uh, turning to cost and, and your question, um, I, 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 I completely agree, I think, with your remark and actually, um, <laughs> I would have a, a, back to you a question, or at least, I mean, this is a reflection I have, uh, and I have no answer for, for you, unfortunately, but how we account for the fact that, I mean, for the time being, I, I mean, I will keep the car example, but maybe it fit not very well, but I was wondering, I mean, also when preparing this conference, uh, you have a car, uh, today you are paying a price for the car, and you, you add this device that collect data now, basically you say, okay, in order of actually pay, I mean, charging customer for the car, now I'm charging customer for the, uh, I, I'm charging, I mean, third party for the data. And then basically you see that in this framework, then basically the whole business model changed completely, and this is a data-oriented business model. So it means that all the investment you are making, this is then to gather data that you can then sell. And in this case, it means that actually what you need to take into account is actually the profitability of the full business in order to set the, the access price. And I think this is very, I mean, defining as to what is the business model of the company and whether indeed data will be used, I mean, as a byproduct that is not valued at all, or whether this is kind of now the business has completely shift 
is something that is extremely important. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, ju just maybe one point uh, that has been already, I mean, mentioned, but we, we discuss, I mean, a lot about, I mean, uh, this question from the pool about market failure. And I would tend to agree that there may be some market failure, but what I'm struggling, and maybe this is my reading, but sometimes I have the feeling that we put, the, I mean, maybe not exactly, but, but DMA and DA, for example, on the same level, but I have the feeling that this is very different because in, in the DA framework, I mean, these, these rules apply to everyone. We are not speaking about gatekeepers that have like very, I mean, data that no one has. I mean, we are speaking about industry, I mean, kind of coffee make, I mean, uh, uh, co coffee co coffee machine makers that actually compete so you have system competition so i mean there is a question as to indeed you really need i mean to impose any rules as to the share of data or whether this is something that can come out of the market naturally so so i think that we need to be careful when we kind of looked at everything to to bear in mind that we always have in mind i mean those uh, gafa i mean facebook google etc but, but i mean the data act is not about those guys i mean they are about other people that are much smaller and may not have at all market power yeah, yeah. very good point uh, uh bruno you have uh, the the honor to conclude <laughs> I will say. yes thank you thank you for good questions i have the honor to conclude adding more questions and problems and solutions but uh, what can we do um the first question was about, uh, I simplify here, is free an outcome, free data access an outcome compatible with friend? I think it takes us a little bit back on a more, I wouldn't say philosophical, but our, how we as a society and businesses see different business models, different in the yeah, business model innovation, how do we accept them? Um, let's, let's try and follow the conclusion. So if we accept that free is, is, a, is, is, a, is, is a friend outcome, then in a sense we are diminishing the value of the, the data itself. I mean, in, in, in the tech sector back in the day, I don't know if still now, the concept of data exhaust was used. So here's some data by clicking and moving that is happening and the user does not realize, but it's actually very valuable once you start collecting it at scale. Um, we've seen this in all the, also other parts of the economy, sometimes to type, you know, make concrete examples. I remember when I used to live in London back in the day, it was becoming a thing that restaurants and fast foods would leave their oil used the next day it wasn't valuable for them. Somebody would come and pick it up. It became a resource. And that's, that's, that's been done before. Of course, there are things that become valuable at another stage. But the more as a society we understand that data is valuable and we have done it, so the more um, uh, turning it into, into a free um, uh, product ser service, it, it seems counterintuitive. Um, there is a question related to the um, Telecom's experience and experience in other regulated sectors, how to strike the right access price, essentially. Um, uh, it's it's going to be a tricky question, essentially, in DMA. It's a difficult balance, and I think the ju jury will be still out, and uh, we, we, will, uh, we will see. Um, but when we think about Data Act, I think this is where we should be maybe placing more of a spotlight, because uh, it's, it's a train that is you know, about to leave the platform. There will be a lot of work needed there and maybe less attention, despite the big, broad, uh, horizontal impact. It's hard to believe that Data Act is meant to hit as a policy, to hit at data uh, holders as hard as uh, vert, um, sectoral regulation of telecoms, for example, was meant to hit and open up um, telecom bottleneck assets, uh, which were you know, general economic significance. Data Act will apply in a lot of sectors and products and transactions which are relatively minor in the greater scheme of things. Sure, it's on a large scale, but what, um, what do we expect? There's also another side effect. We're thinking about, you know, Data Act perhaps as a way to enforce, to, sorry, to stimulate uh, European digital sovereignty, a form of industrial policy, maybe by creating European champions in these aftermarkets. At the same time, this is a, uh, these are rules which will create uh, access to all who uh, want to uh, want to ask, um, not necessarily a European player. So the only exception is for DMA gatekeepers. But you know we we are opening up um, to facilitate this you know aftermarket and maybe brokerage uh, business models. But we we don't necessarily know that this will keep a competitive advantage to Europe. And uh, um, also the um, there are there will be implementation questions because if some of these firms that have used data access under the DMA then want to you know, they change hands and they maybe uh, become part of a um, DMA gatekeeper group. How can you unpack the data that was previously acquired by the company? Does it mean that the company who touches data act provision 
can never in the future ever, ever, ever be, if I'm a founder and entrepreneur and I think my exit strategy is to maybe find a, a good buyer that is a, a DMA gatekeeper or others, does it mean that if I have even once in my life touched the data provision, the data became part of my business model and company, it cannot be unpacked. Therefore, I've precluded a you know, normal you know, venture capital and entrepreneurial strategy. That's, a, that's also a challenge and we don't have a remedy for that or a solution to kind of wrap and unwrap the data in a way that safeguards the intention of the data act. So that's, a, that's something else that we need to start, scratch our heads with. And uh, let me say thank you once again for a very interesting conversation. Thank you, Marco, thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, to you and uh, to the other uh, speakers. So I would like uh, now to invite uh, Carmine Di Noia and Pierluigi Paco to, um, to the desk so that uh, they can give uh, the concluding remarks uh, for the conference. Okay, so, so I start. Okay, so, uh, uh, by the way, still apologies for not being, uh, you know, having attended all the, 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 the conference, but okay, yes, there was in room for other issues, but thank you. This was very interesting for me. I'm a bit biased by, by my, actually, with Pierluigi, we share uh, uh, many things, friends, but also the, uh, he was some years before me at CONSOP, the securities regulator, we have spent uh, a lot of my professional career before joining the OECD last year, and um, both as an economist and then, uh, and then as a commissioner for, for the last six years. And I have to say that this uh, I was discussing yesterday at dinner was a, a very, this, these topics are, you know, very important also, and I've been, uh, you know, tackling them and during also my uh, studies, academic uh, also part. Because, you know, data is, is, is such an important issue. And in some cases, like in the industries that I have been, uh, you know, working on and also supervising, they can really change, uh, you know, the feature and the structure. I'm thinking, for example, the exchange industry, stock exchange, you know, typical, by the way, for you, competition, you know, guys, expert is typical, you know, in uh, old times, uh, typical, you know, monopoly, the national stock exchange, national companies, national intermediaries, national investors. And with, something like listing and trading, which were typically, uh, you know, outputs of an exchange. Now they are inputs. Why? Because now in the exchange world uh, with uh, market, financial market integration, uh, think about Lon London Stock Exchange. I always say LSE is not even, it's not anymore London, it's not anymore stocks, it's not anymore exchange. Why? It's, you know, a big, you know, a data vendor, data provider. So data now, and so, so now listing and trading, which by the way are probably, under you know underpriced in selling why because from being output they become inputs okay then to sell data so these are really this is very important and actually also the the, the last panel was uh, was uh, was quite important so in, in this uh, i would say information age uh, the dimension of data with also some of the classic features that again in uh, also in some industries but in general are there so network effects uh, uh, access, uh, pricing, compensation, uh, interoperability are, you know, the typical feature are, are quite, quite important. Also, I, I'm part of these, I've been part for many years of these uh, uh, boring regulators that were issuing boring regulations. And, but I think that maybe in some cases they can be, they can be good, but more and more that should be then probably harmonized. But, uh, so, I mean, I have been, uh, I mean, I, uh, I listened this morning, but I have my, my colleagues who, Report and me inform me of also of, of yesterday uh, discussion. But okay, so what is important is that okay, more and more in many industries, so data are essential to compete, to compete in in in, in certain markets, and you know can can lead it also to, to important uh, you know benefits, uh, exponential benefits, I would say. And uh, data, and this is another typical dimension of many industries, are you know enable uh, uh, firms to to innovate. Okay, so so the the access, the availability, whatever, then can be all the discussion are, you know, are essential. But uh, the second thing, and again, I've seen in my my previous industries, 
is that uh, the evolution of technology, okay, all over, you know, computers, I mean, we have seen uh, uh, remote access in many industries, uh, cloud and so on. So it has dramatically, you know, changed the dimension, accelerated, you know, the availability, elaboration, and so what you can get then from, from, uh, from data. But at the same time, okay, that can be obstacles coming, again, as a typical standard in many industries from the behavior of others. So it could be the incumbent, other you know, market participants, but also by uh, stemming from the boring uh, regulations and, and uh, regulators. So this has an uh, implication, obviously, for, for the level of competition of, uh, of, uh, of markets. And OK, there are, uh, there are issues, so it's important to address you know, uh, barriers that are you know, uh, uh, to, to firms that basically harness the, the full exploitation of, uh, of the potential, potential of data. Sometimes data cannot be, you know, available. Okay. And this again was, was mentioned, uh, you know, many times. This is again a, a great barrier to, to, to innovation. Uh, sometimes, uh, and again, typical in some industries, uh, there is uh, the level, the accumulation of data by incumbent firms, obviously, can, can be a significant barrier to market entry. And this is especially in some industry, which are, you know, where the, the main feature is uh, characterized by, by network and network effects. I mean, we, again, traditionally financial markets, uh, you know, liquidity attracts liquidity, and that's why, but also network direct and cross uh, network effects. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, Cosimo was mentioning obviously SMEs financing and also, you know, his feature uh, are there. We have seen in the, in the past, and again, there are cycles, so, you know, maybe SMEs go where there is liquidity, liquidity of the other. So they compete in a sense in having. Uh, uh, liquidity, but then at the same time, it's important to be there and intermediaries go where the other intermediaries go, but also where the firms are there. So we, you have cross effect. And, uh, but obviously, uh, firms uh, incumbent uh, or in any case, those that uh, have produced uh, or accumulate data, obviously, they uh, maybe uh, to say it, uh, you know, mildly, they do not uh, uh, care, very happy to, or they can discourage competition. Okay. So regulators, we have seen, we have been in discussion also in this panel. Okay. I'll, uh, taking, I would say, action, uh, right or wrong in uh, many, you know, uh, geographical areas, the EU with different, you know, the, uh, the different tax, but also in other places, uh, also imposing, I would say, open access uh, to data in many industries, uh, banking and others. This is obviously one, one, one important feature, interoperability, but, but this is a necessary but not sufficient, probably, uh, condition. So this is, this is why we need, uh, again, we need more and more innovation, which I think is something that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important. We need so, to foster innovation through, through uh, you know, the access and the exploitation of data. And uh, maybe here, okay, you may have so other, I would say, parallel issues, which can be, can be top down and bottom up also. So not only again uh, coming, so for example, development of standards, which can be, can be, can, can be an important issues. Okay, yesterday I was uh, in, in Rome uh, discussing it at Sony. Okay, there was uh, obviously the role, sometimes you have market failures. Uh, okay, the role of subsidies can be also, uh, can, can be a role, uh, direct, indirect, uh, subsidy, in, uh, you know, in compensation, in pricing, or subsidies in, in some other cases. But, uh, and just to quickly conclude, because I'm between uh, uh, you uh, and the Pierluigi and the lunch, which is probably more interesting. I mean, it's a beautiful place. Now, maybe here, given that the borders, I would say, of the industry characterized by, I would say, an important role of data. I mean, these are obviously, there is no territorial border anymore. So obviously these are more and more, uh, you know, international industries. So that's why I think uh, I have to, uh, to sell my carpet. I think <laughs> the, 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 the role of, uh, okay, international organization, but international standards, I think, uh, and international cooperation, international dialogue is, is really, you know, essential. We have done, and then thanks to, my, my colleague, uh, Ori Antonio, all the colleagues of, of, of the competition division. I think OECD also historically has played a, a big, uh, a big, a big role in that. Uh, uh, the, the recommendation of specific to this that I guess you, you all know, enhancing access uh, to and sharing of uh, data is, uh, is, is important, advising, you know, how, okay, more or less governments, uh, not only OECD, but also others obviously can maximize, you know, the benefits of, uh, of data access and, and, and also sharing arrangements with uh, while protecting. Actually, again, it was also an important feature: individual and, and uh, organizational rights. Uh, okay, there should be many, many issues. But also, okay, we're trying also to to also to to uh, practicing uh, what we preach. So we have, I think, uh, 
uh, last year when it was last November, we have uh, launched the competition enforcement cooperation, you know, uh, database, which provides basically data. So also in our case, we provide uh, data, you know, access from, uh, from many jurisdictions to about rules, uh, practices, and, 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 and processes for cross-border cooperation. Honestly, we are fighting a lot to try to convince to have more and more cooperation also, not only in the EU, which is easy given also the, I would say, the federal structure of uh, DigiComp and national regulators, but also to, to others. And uh, so I think this is, a, this is an important issue. So again, international cooperation, I think, is essential, especially when we talk about it to, to achieve, you know, the objectives of uh, uh, fostering competition and, and innovation. So that's why I think uh, events uh, like these, uh, and again, thanks to um, EUI, and I like this uh, also so joint uh, work uh, with the OECD that uh, that uh, have been doing uh, we are doing uh, and uh, again I'm new in my role but I think it's uh, this is really essential sharing these uh, discussions also with uh, with um, I think a stronger stronger you know uh, different views because this is the way to also to foster I would say innovation in our ideas so thank you very much and then I think Pierluigi to, to you Well, uh, thank you, Carmen. Uh, let's, uh, uh, I mean, as you know, it's difficult, uh, uh, it's late, and it's difficult to conclude a conference like this uh, uh, on the merit. It's, uh, it's not difficult, it's impossible. Let's put it, <laughs> let's be frank about it. Uh, we started from market failures in the first panel, then we moved to a discussion that is important about the relation between uh, uh, sector regulation and horizontal regulation, uh, uh, competition and regulation in this area, and we dealt with those, uh, seeing how tensions are also there, but uh, maybe one thing that came out was that probably there are areas in which a more specific sector regulation could be more effective than uh, general things, but uh, I think this, as in many, in many instances, is a provisional result because uh, Sometimes principles are better than detailed rules. Uh, when you are talking of innovative and digital, quickly transforming areas. So, even on this conclusion, I would be careful, even if it makes some sense in this area. Then there was the discussion yesterday of protection and sharing of personal data. It was an important discussion. Is uh, one of the big issues here of the tensions, uh, and uh, maybe explains why some of those market failures at the beginning, the difficulties in transferring, uh, in having B2B in an orderly way in the, in the economy. Then, um, so let me also uh, recall uh, Vera El Castillo with uh, her uh, hands in uh, showing us the machinery that they are doing. And it was impressive the fact that uh, they are really trying to get to the, the pieces of the story. That, that's, uh, that's good. That's, uh, I will come to Europe in a second. Uh, I want to finish with this uh, uh, list. Uh, this morning was very interesting, the interoperability and data portability panel, and also the parallel with the telcos with other areas, because it's, uh, it's clear that we are not building from any, anywhere. We are building from something, so we have to understand that that's something even if this is much more difficult than this emerged in the panel this morning. Finally, there was this discussion about uh, uh, the value of data that is in, very interesting and is at the core in the end of the question, <laughs> because these uh, are economic. I, as, um, I, would, I, was I would joke if uh, this data are the new oil or not. I put in the slide almost joking, somebody took me seriously. Uh, I may write a book at some point <laughs> about if data are the new oil. I, I'm thinking about this. but. Uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, more seriously, let's say that the value of data clearly is at the core of the, of the question, the way which was posed, for instance, uh, we have to understand how much value is in the personal data, how much value is in the business data, what is, what is in the middle of, the, of this, how to regulate all this. But let me come finally, so this is a short summary without any uh, attempt to real conclusion, but let me come, come to what I think uh, uh, came out from, instead from the 
the kernel of the discussion in a sense. The first is Europe. Europe is trying, I think that Europe lives a little bit with a GDPR illusion. Because Europe had this, okay, uh, I'm not a fan of GDPR, and it's full of people that are not a fan of GDPR. But in the end, Europe came out with this illusion that we had regulated uh, with GDPR the world. And there is a truth in this, because even besides Europe, people took us seriously <laughs> somehow and thought, oh, yes, there is a model. The, the pers privacy should work this way. This doesn't mean that they followed us. That's an, a different story. But there is some attention. And so somehow I think that on, on this other data, data world, we are saying, well, maybe we could regulate it again. And there is, I don't, I don't want to name any French uh, uh, commissioner, but <laughs> uh, there is a trend that thinks that this is possible somehow. Uh, I don't know. I, it's really, uh, for me, it's really an open question. Maybe it works. I wouldn't have believed in GDPR. And in the end, it's working in some strange way. Maybe it works again. I think this time is more difficult. It's more difficult for many reasons. The, the first is that these are also industrial data. I mean, we are not a leading industry of the world at the moment. And that's an issue. Do we have the, all this power? Is really regulatory Europe such? Uh, I don't know. I think that this is something we should think about. That doesn't mean that we don't have to attempt to regulate the data world. We have to attempt. But the question is how we relate with the rest of the world in doing this, and how this will bring us uh, in reality in uh, an equilibrium with the rest of the world. What will become from uh, for our own innovation that has a lot of problems. Eh? We, are, we know that we are behind in many areas of, uh, of the digital world in innovation in Europe. This will help or will damage? I don't know. That's something we should really think about. Second, uh, there was, I think it was Begona that mentioned this uh, before. I liked it very much. She say, well, there is something behind platform in the, dig the digital world. Is, there is life behind, behind platforms. And that's exactly, by the way, what the Center for Digital Society is trying to build, is this idea that we want to deal with platform, and we want to understand what is happening with the digital world. And so we think that there is life behind platforms. That doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with platforms. Platforms are so important and so central that we have to deal with them. But the question is, what is really happening? In, um, and taking the angle of data is one of the good ways to face this thing in a more general way, OK? Uh, as if you take AI is another angle to look at this in a more general way. And there are other ways. And we'll, try to develop this program, in a sense, in this direction. Uh, one thing that uh, I, I think we should discuss more, maybe in, the, in future events uh, and in future research on this, uh, is the relation between all this data and advertisement. This doesn't come too much in this discussion, in my opinion, and this is important, because there are different models in the world of the use of data that are important for many things, but clearly, I think uh, Isabella was saying the difference between target and not target, and this kind of is not really a, a subtle difference. <laughs> it's an important one. So we need to discuss more about uh, what is uh, legitimate in the future in advertising and the relation with that. And another clear uh, relation is data and security. We didn't discuss much of this, but it's another very serious issue for Europe, for everybody, and uh, on real-time data, this clearly was in part discussed, but it's more general, probably, the discussion. So you see, there are uh, many themes on data that remains open, and there are a couple of things more that came out instead were discussed, but I think uh, discussion should be much longer and much more complex. And actually, I announce here something. And this is the regulator task and coordination with all this digital transformation, digital, these digital new rules, particularly in the European Union. In fact, we are thinking to launch in the next weeks a call for paper because we want that people study and we organize a major conference probably next spring. Uh, we would like to have a major 
people studying the issue of how national regulators will be impacted by all this regulation, how they will adapt to, how they will deal with all this in Europe, and maybe beyond Europe, how there will be the relation with other areas of the world, the coordination with other areas of the world. So the idea is, on this is not to do in a policy conference like this one, but to do a scientific conference after a call of paper. We think that uh, on this we need to dig a bit more uh, seriously. Finally, uh, clearly there is uh, the issue of uh, closing all these dots. So, and I think it's too soon to do because most of these things are not laws. We are discussing laws that are coming, regulation that are coming. The MADSA are already in place, even if they are not, as we know, fully operational. But these other laws are not even there. So, uh, I think we'll have to come back on all this, uh, also on the data, or just on the data issue, also in terms of understanding better when the, all the dots are, uh, are there, uh, are joined, and we can discuss. Okay, I don't want to add more because it's time to close. Uh, let me thank first uh, the OECD colleagues for this great cooperation. I think it was a very nice uh, Antonio, Ori, uh, Carmine, all the uh, OECD colleagues that cooperated. It was a great cooperation. We'll try to continue. I think that we'll uh, organize something next year in the same mold. We'll see the topic, we'll discuss. Uh, then uh, let me thank the AU team, uh, the logistic organization, Isabetta Marcida, the scientific team, uh, Nicolò, Daniel, others, and especially Marco Botta. This was really my Professor Botta, uh, almost 100% work, the scientific organization of this. So, Marco, thank you very much. Let me finish reminding you that uh, the next important conference we are organizing is on, on a different topic, but uh, as hot as this one, because it's on fairness in the digital world. So it's another nice angle to discuss. This will be in October. Uh, you, if you are interested, you are all welcome. And uh, uh, we'll finish uh, who, who remains here as a, a lunch and then a bus to go uh, to the city or to the airport or to the station. Um, let me thank finally the people online to participate to this conference online is really hard. I have participated to some and I know it. So thanks to the people online and thanks to the participants. I have a safe trip home. Thank you very much.